All right, greetings to you all in Jesus' precious name. This evening, um, we'll turn back to the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. We will read the last few verses of this chapter responsively. I want to continue to bring uh, some lessons the Lord has taught me from, from this book uh, during the recent weeks of, uh, of the wonderful time of waiting on the Lord. Um, we'll turn to Malachi chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. Malachi Grandamu, Mudo Adhyayamu, Padamur Ninchi, Paddimdi Lo Untuna Vakya Bagani, Chadukun Uttara Pratyutramga, Devani Vakyam Korake, Manamu Ayan Vaipuku Pradhana Purkunga, Manadustin Malinchkunam, Malachi chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, responsibly. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. Verse 15, and now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that fear the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Verse 17. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth not him. Shall we pray and look to the Lord? Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for the privilege of coming together and worshipping you, the true and the living God, the exalted one, and yet the humbled one, the great I am, the eternal one, yet who took upon himself flesh and blood to come down to seek and save us. Praise and worship you for being our God. And many in this world have not this privilege. Lord, you poured out such worth into us in that you paid the highest price to purchase us. Father, we thank you, we praise you as we long to have you give us your word that have eternal life, your word that regenerates us, your word that redeem, Lord, uh, that revives us to make us to walk as redeemed people. Father, I pray that you may speak through me to me, to each one of us this evening. And in the ministry of your word, we may be given the, the much needed grace, Lord, to walk worthy of the high calling that is upon our lives, to be called as a saint in Christ and to be called as a servant of God that you long us to be. Father, help us to be walking worthy of this highest call that is upon our lives. For we ask all this, in the precious and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This evening, as I said, uh, we'll continue our learning um, in a few things that the Lord has blessed my life. I put together the slides in a very last minute. Uh, I thank the Lord for enabling because um, most of what I'm preaching is in English, so some of you who want to follow in Telugu will have to look to the slide. So I'm going to begin with a question, although the sermon title is there to give you some hint. Um, the question is, what is the most valuable object and its approximate worth in this, in this whole known world and creation? What is the most valuable object? 
and its approximate worth. You know, uh, there are many thoughts and many things that my thoughts went into. Uh, if you think in your own family, what is the most valuable object? Some of us might uh, think it is our house or some of us might think it is the jewelry that our wives or sisters have. Those are the thoughts that would come to our mind. And in the same lines, one thing that came to my mind is probably the Kohinoor diamond. The Kohinoor diamond, um, which actually has gone into being the crown jewel in the queen's crown. Uh, today, India is trying to ask and give us back our Kohinoor diamond <laughs> that was taken away or stolen away. I thought that probably is the most uh, val most valuable object. Um, essentially, its worth is 591 million, it seems, if you are curious to know. Uh, and then I try to just look, of course, the only source nowadays is almost accepted is Google. Uh, we don't kind of go around much apart from that. And it turns out, the most valuable object that is in the whole world, according to Google, is not even the massive rocket that recently had been launched on a lunar mission that is called NASA's Atimaeus, the lunar rocket. For some of you physics and uh, science students, this is just worth about 10 to $20 billion, it seems. Uh, this is more than 560, 591 million. Um, but uh, even that rocket is like $20 billion at max. But now, the most valuable object, according to Google, is that the International Space Station. It is valued at the worth of $150 billion uh, as, a, as a worth. And uh, we all know it is a work of many nations coming together to kind of have a station there and to monitor whatever is coming towards Earth and whatever that needs to kind of help life upon this Earth. Um, so International Space Station, Antarjatiya, Antariksha, Stavaram. That is the most valuable object according to Google. Now, that said, um, According to the word of God, now coming to the true most valuable object that you and I should be taking note is the washed and cleansed saint in Christ. We all know the verse in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. It says that you and I have, if you and I are in Jesus Christ, we are not redeemed. We are not redeemed by the corruptible things. The reason I could say safely is that a believer, a child of God, a saint in Christ, is more valuable than any other item that Google might list. Is because all those things are corruptible things. The Bible itself says in verse 18, for as much as ye know that ye are not redeemed with corruptible things. A day is going to come as much as the International Space Station is valued the highest, it's going to corrupt. It's going to be no more. I mean, even the earth and the sky and the heaven, and they too will be gone. The first earth, as, as we read in Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, um, verses 10 onwards, the day of the Lord, as it says, is going to be like, it's like a thief in the night and heavens shall pass away with great noise and the elements that melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. These are all corruptible things. As much as man takes so much pride in what he has built, there is a day where not just those things that were built, but even those that we are upon and those that we are under, they will be burnt up and will be gone. And so 
So they are called corruptible things. And the Bible says, you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers. But verse 19, it says, but ye are, but with the precious blood of Christ. He compares with silver and gold because in the times of Peter, they are the most valuable things. Beyond that, people had nothing more. You can see in the times of the biblical times, gold and silver is the most valuable thing, but they still are corruptible. And then he says, you've not been redeemed or bought with just corruptible things, but incorruptible or precious blood of Christ as of the lamb without blemish or without spot. And so you can, you and I can safely say that the most valuable object in this world is a saint in Christ, Christulo Parishududu, a servant of God. Because a servant of God, as we would take a look in Malachi chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, it concludes by saying that you and I will come to understand the difference between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. And uh, so we're going to understand this, uh, this truth about an invaluable God who is valuing us. What is the valuing that God does upon us as those that are redeemed by the blood of Christ? Ganamayana devudu manlanu velakatte vidhanani manam adhan cheskuntu untam. Aite dantlo there is a, a calling that we are going to be challenged with. Uh, it's not so much about just trying to understand what God is doing in valuing us as we were just taking note of how much worth he says that you and I are so valuable in sight of this invaluable God, so infinitely worth God, he is valuing us. These lessons have been learned in the context of Last, last time when I touched in Malachi chapter 3, I was bringing to us a changeless God changing us. In verses 1 to 12, it is centered in, in verse 6. We read, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. We have a God who is unchanging, immutable. He's the same. And so... If he is changing us, that change is going to be so beautiful, so wonderful. And we saw of, in verses 2 and 3 of how, how he is like a refiner's fire, how he is a fuller soap in gently and powerfully changing us inside out. And that's our God. And if he is changing us, when all circumstances change, when things that we think are stable and good like our jobs, or like our health, like our families and everything. We think that is a good state, but beyond that, when things change, when we are shaked, we ought to take note that we are in the hands of a God who is changing us. He is a one who is refining us, who is cleansing us. And so it's a blessed thing. That's what we saw in the conclusion of that message, Malachi chapter 3, verse 12. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. If a changeless God is working on you, changing you and me, you and I are blessed. And such is our privileged portion that God has given us to be in the hands of a God who changes not, but yet changes us patiently, gently, continually, working to that end goal to see his own image in you and me. We saw that all. Now, we were going to look at this very challenging portion. If you were to be, look at the very first verse, you would be challenged. Verse 13, God has an accusation in this portion in verse 13. He says, your words... Your words have been stout against me. As we consider this, I want to give a brief outline for this few verses. 
right. Is there some problem or can you hear me? No. Check, check, check. Check. Yes, you can hear me now, I think. Yeah. So I just want to give a brief outline in these few verses 13 to 18. The first one in verses 13 and 15, we see a God is a God who listens to our proud words. That's what we see as we begin to look at your words have been stout or words out of pride. This is an accusation that God brings upon God's people. You want to understand what this, this complaint of God is and what he means by making us to be aware of this. So the first part of this portion is he listens. A God listens to our proud words. A God listens to our praising words or our praise words. We read in verse 16 that he makes a book of memorial out of the words that come from people who praise him. We're going to look at that. And our God lists us as precious worth. We're going to conclude by looking at what is valuing of God upon our lives. Before we come to that last part, the two, uh, I mean, the first part is where we will spend a little good time trying to understand why God is giving out this accusation. At that time in the children of Israel, they were called as a special people. Uh, in the very first chapter, first verse we see, sec second verse we see, God has a complaint about these people of God, the children of Israel then. God has chosen Jacob, Israel, as a special nation to be a priest and kings to all nations. That was his plan, a covenant nation. And lo and behold, they have far gone away from that great plan of God that God has for his people. And because they've gone astray, they are having a thought about why have you stopped loving us? And God says in verse 2, I have loved you, saith the Lord, Yet ye say, wherein have you loved us? Then God is helping them understand. Was not Esau God, Jacob's brother? Said the Lord, yet I loved Jacob. Esau was Jacob's brother, but God says, I have loved Jacob, or children of Israel. So God has a number of questions that he is bringing to them and to their consideration to help them understand his heart. And so as we come to verse um, 13 here, come back with me to verse 13, Malachi chapter 3. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Many times we don't know what our heart state is. And God who knows our heart, he brings to us what our heart state is. As we open the word, we come to understand what our heart state is. And so, as we consider this God listening to our proud words, what is the cause for such proud words? By the way, before we go uh, further, we need to understand pride is the first sin that has been committed in all creation. It is pride that caught even Satan to fall prey and become the so-called devil. A man of God says, it is pride that, the, that made the angels be called or become devils or demons. And it is humility that makes even a human being be like an angel before the Lord. Meaning, there is a great exaltation that God gives to those that humble themselves. And so, we ought to be guarding our hearts, our lives with something called pride. And uh, here is, what is the cause for this proud words? There are two things that God gives to us in verse 14 um, and uh, verse 15. Let's first understand verse 14, where the first thing that we see is, Ye have said, it is vain to serve God, and what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance? The first thing that is the cause for proud words is a wrong assessment of godliness. 
godliness in this world and especially in this country and this area that you and I live in is is absolutely not as worth as what you and I might might uh, come to recognize on a sunday when we are here we recognize the great worth that we and we have and we cherish in christ but going back monday back to our work going back on a re- regular day to day things there is a sense of worth that we might attribute to godliness when we compare it with how the world values there can be a wrong assessment of godliness and that comes by how you and i might say this it is vain to serve god and broad profit is it when we have kept his ordinances a wrong assessment of godliness and and scripture gives to us the right assessment of it come with me to sec first timothy chapter 6 verse 6 first timothy chapter 6 verse 6 even in the early church paul saw it fitting that there are those who would make make godliness for a low for for a low profile gain of this earthly gains uh, and so paul wants in in his own way he says but godliness with contentment is great gain godliness is great gain even in chapter 4 he goes about to say that there is great blessing in verse 7 but refuse profane and old wife fables and exercise thyself rather in unto godliness now when we think about godliness often our thought process is how we behave how we conduct ourselves but the first thing that you and i need to recognize is unless you and i are a new creation in christ there is nothing about ourselves that can make us godly godliness is god likeness meaning first of all getting to have the mind of christ and then having a worth or having a thought process of what god thinks god values and valuing the same as how god values now come with me to ephesians chapter 4 ephesians chapter 4 verses 20 21 22 23 and 24 we'll read this few verses paul says but ye have not so learned christ if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in jesus christ that ye prof ye put off concerning the former conversation of the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust verse 23 and be renewed in the spirit of your mind verse 24 and ye put on in that ye put on the new man which after god is created in righteousness and true holiness the first step to godliness is you and i should become a new creation there is no godliness in trying to become outwardly keeping the commandments or learning the scripture portions and trying to follow christ which is what we read in verses 19 and 20 and 21 you might hear god's word you and i might learn so much of god's word and try to follow it but godliness doesn't begin there it is always unless you and i are broken in our pride to recognize how haughty we are how we value what god values how different our value system is our value system is based on the net worth in this in this country in this place what is the net worth and even when we go about introducing ourselves we would say i'm so and so and i work here our usual thought process is a net worth or what we are making or what we are owning what we are possessing that is what is valued by people that we live with and you and i are not to be valuing the same way the value system of a believer and the value system of the world is totally different what god values is what he sees 
in Christ Jesus. Unless you and I are a new creation in Christ Jesus, you and I are not valuable but destined to eternal destruction. And that's where we come to see in Ephesians, the first step to godliness is new creation. In Ephesians 4, verse 23 and 24, it says, 24, last part, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are of God. Which have what oh sorry, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ? So the first step to godliness is a new creation, without which you and I can never attain godliness, never even think about godliness. And that's where we come to see that once you and I are made a new creation, a brand new creation in Christ Jesus, and that would require you and I to be broken in our pride. You know. The, the most difficult thing for a sinner to be made as a saint in Christ is to be broken of his pride. The reason for people to reject Christ and the gospel message is that they would have to humble themselves and reject themselves of all that proud thoughts about themselves and then utterly come bankrupt and poor before this holy and a great God. That's where people stumble. And unless that step of brokenness is brought to be brought as new creation that God makes us in Christ Jesus, there is no room for godliness. And that's where the right assessment of godliness begins. And as soon as you and I are made a new creation, you and I recognize the value of coming to worship this true and living God. We were reminded in the morning worship in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10. We recognize that there is one true God before whom even the nations tremble at his indignation. And they cannot stand before his wrath. And when you and I recognize that we are completely naked and bankrupt before such a holy and a true and a living God, you and I would still be proud about what worth we are in our own wrong assessment. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10, we read, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting King. At His wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide in his indignation. Such is this great and an awesome and holy God. And unless he gives any worth, you and I have no worth. Man, we will look at it in the worth that, the right worth that God has given in the later uh, section. Uh, it is the worth that God gives in making us again a brand new creation we have the right worth and value. And unless we recognize that, you and I would have a wrong assessment of godliness. And coming back to Malachi chapter 3, they have come to see how much people are gaining by serving God. What are they earning? Oh, they are not earning much. Even today, we live in a culture where people look at what you are making by the work that you are doing. If you are not making much, Oh, that work is not valued as much. But the truth is, God's assessment, God's valuing system is completely different from the world system. And there he comes to say, the people of God have come to say that it is vain to serve God. It is what profit is there that we have kept his ordinance. It is vain to obeying God. Those were the thoughts that people had as a wrong assessment of godliness. The second reason for proud words is wrong assessment of worldliness. This is another direction. Apart from godliness, worldliness is also wrongly assessed. How do we wrongly assess worldliness? We read in verse 15, 
And now we call the proud happy. The, the people with proud hearts, Garvapu Hrudyal Kalvinavaru, Ashiradimpu Bandavaru, Anedi, the world says that, the world assesses it that way. That's why people don't humble themselves. People who live with us, who work with us, who uh, are living in our neighborhoods, they look at what they have and they, their hearts are swelling in pride of what they are making, whom they are working for. And so there is a way they think they are blessed. And often you hear this word, I'm blessed, meaning I lack nothing. I have all that I want. I have a good house. I have a good um, family. I mean, and I don't need anything. I don't need even God. Why do, I, why do I need God? That's the way the world system is. And because they say, this is what blessedness is. If you don't have a job or if you don't value the way they value, you and I are treated not uh, sane or not right. But the truth is, you and I can get into their way of assessing. And that way of assessing worldliness is you and I soon like them might call or oh, they are blessed. But truly, they are utterly bankrupt before a holy God. And so we come to see of the wrong assessment of worldliness, of proud hearts, wicked works. Those that are having wicked works, in verse 15 we read, yea, they that work wickedness are set up. The word set up in KJV, in footnote, is given as built. They are being, they are being nicely growing up and their lives are being built so nicely. Even out of wicked means, people are building up their lives. But we can't say the same. God says, it is blessed to have little, but by the righteous means, then to have more by the wicked means. That's what the scripture says. And quickly, the God tempters. They are being delivered. Those that tempt God, those that use God as, uh, as someone who is like, like a buddy, they are being delivered. They are not being punished. They are getting away. So all this wrong assessment can get into us. And you and I can also become like them in assessing the way the world assesses. And these are the reasons for proud words, it seems. That's what God gives an assessment of why he's listening to their proud words. And as you and I come to see that these are the proud words, the thing that should break this pride from our lives is a right assessment. And the right assessment is brought to us in taking a scriptural view of what God sees as valuable. Turn with me of Apostle Paul's life. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, verse 3, we come to see Apostle Paul as a remedy for pride. He gives us a remedy in verse 3. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according to God, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. By the way, the word soberly, sober-mindedness, is clear-mindedness. That is to see clearly, it seems. If you and I have glasses, sometimes if our vision is not clear and we are not able to see clearly, we put on glasses so that our vision is corrected and we see exactly what is there. Likewise, when we put on the scriptural lens, we, clear, we see clearly. We have a clear thinking. And that clear thinking is not to think high about ourselves. And to think in the covering of grace, in the covering of God's grace. Apostle Paul does that well. You know, the worth that God has given to Apostle Paul is immense. 
we note he is someone God used so mightily to write about 33% of the New Testament, 13 or so epistles as historians take note. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, he begins in this way. And he says, this is how grace-covered thinking is going to be. Grace-covered thinking is going to be assessing ourselves in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in 1 Timothy verse, chapter 1, verse 12 to 15, that I'm, uh, verse 12, he says, my calling is based on grace. God has called me by his grace and mercy. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, he says, for I am the least of apostles. Yes, God says you shall be the apostle of the Gentiles, but his assessment is in his own heart, the way he is thinking is, I'm least of apostles. You know, he was greatly and mightily used. None of the apostles were used to write the kind of percentage of the scripture that was written in the New Testament. But yet he says, I am the least of apostles. That is grace-based thinking. God might say, you are valued so high, but we come to think what we are by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I am the least of apostles. He doesn't stop there. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, he says, I am, I am the least of all the saints. This is the next level. Now, coming to considering among the saints, when he compares amidst the saints, you and I sit before, beside each other, um, things keep coming up between us and our brothers and sisters or even in our families, whose, whose view will prevail or whose words will have or, or even in, in a husband and wife decision making, will it be mine or will it be hers? Whose view or whose decision will prevail? We might have difference of opinion. But the way Apostle Paul comes and he says, I am the least of all the saints, not the greatest. And not only there, he comes in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he says, I'm the chief of all the sinners. That's his assessment by the grace of God. Now, yes, these are all a clue to how grace-based thinking is. Krupa, krupa, alochana, krupa, yuttamayana, alochana, irakanga on time. Apostol lo, takku vadanu, parishuddala lo, atyalpudanu, and then, popular law, pradhanudan. And not only that, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, he says, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, he goes on to boast. That's the only time he boasted in his life. And even before that boasting, he says, I'm nothing. I am nothing. There is a wonderful principle about humility. Humility is not saying, not only saying I'm nothing or even trying to say I am this and that, which is, which is required in our lives. To not to think high, you need to think low about ourselves. But humility will go to the extent of not even thinking about yourself. <laughs> not even thinking about yourself. That's why he says I'm nothing. Nothing is really nothing. Have you ever thought it is something? <laughs> nothing is nothing. I'm not even worth thinking about myself. That's what he says. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, the last part he says, he's thinking, I am nothing. I'm not even worth thinking of, of myself. And that's the way he boasts. Yes, he boasts in his infirmities. He boasts in the suffering that he had for Christ. And he says, I am not less than any of the chiefest of the apostles, but he's not comparing with the real apostles. They were false apostles who said, we are chief super apostles. That was the title. Nowadays we have in, in India, everyone wants this title, apostle so-and-so, prophet so-and-so, nothing less than apostle is the, is the title that they keep. 
And in such a time as that, Paul was not actually comparing with true apostles, but they were these false apostles who called themselves as super apostles. And then with comparing with them, he says, I'm not least to be compared. If you want to compare with these super apostles, these false apostles, I'm nowhere least. I suffered more than anyone. And then he goes on to boast. But even if before boasting, he says, I am nothing. And so in humility, we come to a point to not even think about ourselves. Because we will be captivated by this God who is infinitely worth being caught up in his awesomeness. That we would have no more room to think about ourselves. And when you and I are filled with thoughts of him, the next thing that would come out of us is not proud words, but praise words, it seems. And that's where we come to, as we move to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. We come to see that the praise words, the cause for praise words, is two things that Paul, uh, that Malachi lists in verse 15. They that feared him. Malachi Mudu Padharlo. Yentuku Gana Parchu Martel, Usto Nai. Devani Gana Parchu Martel, Kalkarna Vainti and Chipiste. I prejalu, Devaniki, Bayapaduar. They that feared him. And not only they that feared him, but they will come to look at what that means. Those that thought of him. We read that in verse 16, the last part. They thought of his name. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. These are the two things that caused in them praise words. Not proud words, but praise words. And why is it that they had praise words? They feared him as a, in a small example that we see. If you just think about Psalm 139. This is David bringing out a psalm about an all-knowing, an all-present, an all-wise an almighty and an all-holy God. Psalm 139 is captivated with the thoughts of God that gives to us the right assessment of God. This is the God that you and I come to. He is an all-knowing God. David was totally captivated by this all-knowing God. Where can I go? From you, who is an all-present God, wherever I go, you are there. Whether you are in a church, whether you are in a workplace or you are in a home, you are everywhere there. And so he was captivated with the thoughts of this awesome God, who is an all-knowing God, an all-wise God, an all-present God, an almighty God, and an all-holy God. When he thought about this, he says in... Psalm 139, verse 13, one verse there he says, Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14, Nivu na antarindriyam lanu, na antarindriyam nive kalaga chesitivi, na thalli garbamandu, nannu nirminchina vaadavu nive, nivu nannu kalaga chesina vidamu chodaga, bhaiyamunu, ashcharyamunu puttu chunnadi. When you and I think about this awesome God and all-knowing and all-wise and all-present and an all-creative, all-holy God, like David, praise will burst out of our, of our hearts, of our mouths. I will praise thee. Verse 14, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. When you and I recognize the worth and have a right assessment of this great God, we would fear Him and we would praise Him and think of Him. Our thoughts are going to be 
are going to be captivated by him. There'll be no more room for our, our thinking about ourselves itself. That is true humility. There, what worth is there to think about me when there is this awesome God, so full of all of attributes that we see briefly here in Psalm 139. So praise comes from our lips, our hearts. And when we have a right assessment of God, and also when we have a right assessment of ourselves. Um, in, in a way, God's people need to have a right assessment. David recognizes whatever worth that he has is what worth that God gave him. Not what the world gives him. The world sees him as a king. He's made a king of Israel, but he is not saying, I am the king. Psalm 145 verse 1, I will extol you my king. He is lost in the king of kings rather than he being a king. That is the portion of God's people that you and I come to a right assessment of him and a right assessment of ourselves. I am fearfully and wonderfully made in his own image. God's people are valuable by the worth that God poured out into you and I. And the worth is he has said, I have made you in, your, in my own image. There is no greater worth that a human being can have apart from the worth that you and I are made in his own image. And that's why it's a matter of his, his great love that this infinite worth that God gave in creating an, in his own image is probably a clue to why he would even step forth to redeeming us. Sometimes you and I wonder, there are the angelic beings as well who have been made by God, who have sinned just like us, who have fallen and have rebelled just like us. But what made God to step down and come and redeem us but not them? I would not be able to comprehensively say, but a clue, a clue, a hint that we find is that you and I are made in his own image. Who is a man or a woman who would not do anything for his own or her own children? I mean, yes, even in, as fallen as we are, we are going to do whatever it takes to rescue our children, right? So worth, so much of worth that he poured out and says, you and I are made in his own image. Now, yes, that's not just the worth. And he has given his own life to remake us in his own image. When we marred his image in sin and rebellion, he comes and says, I'm going to come and remake you, redo you again in perfecting that image that you and I are being restored to in the fullness. And so when you and I tonight, 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 this is our God. He is no different like a father, but a heavenly father who, even in our feeble words, coming from a broken and a contrite heart, that praise is captivating him. He says, I'm going to record that in the book of remembrance. Etch eternally the words of praise that you and I give in the limited comprehension of this great and awesome God is a, is a captivating one to this awesome God that he says, I'm going to put them in the book of remembrance. You and I think nobody is listening to your praise and worship. 
you know, it's being recorded in Zoom and in YouTube. You can go back and listen to it. But more than you and I listening to it, God says, I have put it in the book of remembrance. What a privilege. It's not just a, 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 a YouTube recording. Even the YouTube will be wiped out. I was uh, doing a, a presentation for our sales, uh, for a product uh, release when I was in Oracle. And uh, my product management director, he came and he said, hey man, today you did a good presentation. And after that he says, your, your, your voice has been eternally recorded or your voice has been eternalized is what he's saying. Your words have been eternalized. I mean, he thinks like, because Oracle had captured whatever I have recorded, whatever I gave as a presentation and they'll be there, he thinks that is eternal. There'll be a day where everything will be wiped out. Your iPhone pictures, everything will be wiped out. Nothing will remain. Uh, you can't think about that day, right? <laughs> Still, I mean, my wives can't think about that day. They keep opening up the, the pictures that are taken and they keep reviewing it now and then, so they'll be totally wiped out. But not the book of remembrance. That would be eternal. That praise that you gave in the limited understanding of this awesome God as revealed in his scripture is captivating to this great God because they are the worship of his beloved sons bought with the highest of the price of the precious blood more than any incorruptible things of this world. Such is why he preserves it in the book of remembrance. And so take note, we see that same clue as we move to the last point. As he says, he lists us as precious worth. Come with me to verses 17 and 18 and then I'll close. Verse 17 he says, as a proud father, I would say as a father who is possessive, not a proud father, by the way, in the sense He's very possessive. What, is, what does God say about these people who feared him, whose worship he records, whose words he records? He says, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. He possessively calls them. The cause for preciousness is, why is God listing us as precious worth is, the cause for preciousness is possessively owns us. That's what makes us precious. Oh, our company might own, not own us. They might say, oh, you are a family. Oh, you are, like, we are all one. Today they'll say that. In the next hour they'll say, who are you? I mean, not even give a chance for us to say thank you. But that's not our God. He possessively owns us unto eternity. You belong to me. Your mind, none can say that you are anybody else's. That's our God in how possessively he values. And that's why we are precious. We read in uh, Deuteronomy to the same children of Israel, uh, the last verse of chapter 31. Deuteronomy, turn with me quickly. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 31. Sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 29 and 30. Deuteronomy 29. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people, saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellency, and thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. Israelu, that's the worth that God says when he says, you are mine. And then quickly he says, he not only possessively owns us, he treasurably spares us. Coming back to Malachi chapter 3 verse 17. We talked about Kohinoor diamond, right? You and I are more worth than Kohinoor diamond. In verse 17 he says, in the day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that 
uh, with him. You're not only the son of the Most High God, the daughter of the Most High God. You're, you and I are not only those that are redeemed by incorruptible precious blood, you and I are made up as his jewels. So high and so precious is his worth and value. And then shall, verse 18, then shall he return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. God is so treasuring us in so much so that he lists us as a precious worth. When you and I serve God, God gives us this privilege to be occupied in this world. This is a small lesson that I've learned in the time of the short break that I had. You and I don't get much breaks in this world. As a child of God, if you get a break, be occupied. In uh, these two verses, this is what I've learned throughout my, uh, my, my times of breaks. Luke 19 verse 13, um, occupy till I come is what the master says as he gives certain talents and gives them to invest and to be working with. And in Matthew 20, verse 6, he says, why have you been idle all the day long? A child of God, a servant of God is not to be idle. They are to be occupied in the master's business. There's a greater business of not only praising and declaring his praises in this world that doesn't value God, showing forth his praises, but also working for his great kingdom that is being expanded to cause those that Jesus died for and redeemed to redeem, to work for their sanctification. Meaning, you and I are called to be an agents of giving the, the words of eternal life towards their sanctification. And so that is the highest calling that God has given us. And this precious worth that God gives us is that he calls us as a saint in Christ and a servant of the most high God. And there is no greater calling than that. You and I might say, I work for a king, I work for a company that might be billions of worth or trillions of worth, but there is no greater calling than serving this king of kings, and being the child of this great God, the God of gods that he is. And so when we take note of this, you and I would come to say that this invaluable God is valuing us. Yes, he values us to be such of precious worth, but you and I have an equal responsibility in that valuing of praising him and declaring his praises, recognizing his worth, Showing forth his praises always and also serving him. Serving him because there is no greater one than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to serve in this world, to be occupied in his in our master's business and not to be idle. Soon enough, this world would want to have you be occupied with it. And that's the cherished portion that God gives us. That though we serve in whatever secular jobs that God gives us, we primarily serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. May that be the portion all through the days of our lives. And if you have never understood what it is to be possessed or possessively called as his own, there is no greater time than to come to recognize of what worth Christ had paid in being crushed on the cross of Calvary, shedding his precious blood to be made as his own. When you and I humble ourselves and repent of our sin, then comes this great forgiveness and this great possession of being made as his own. Let's ask the Lord for his blessing on this word and may the Lord enable us to serve him and to walk worthy of this great call that is upon our lives. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for this privilege you've given us to be found in your presence and to come and worship this true and living God. What manner of love that you have bestowed on us that we 
even I, we could be called as your sons and daughters. Father, we thank you for the highest price that was paid in the blood that was shed for the redemption of our souls and to make us your own. Lord, what is man that thou art mindful of? Yes, Lord, it is you who made us in your own image fearfully and wonderfully. And greater love hath no man than this, that one would lay down his life and thank and praise you for the precious love demonstrated on the cross of Calvary. As we continue to ponder on that cross and that work of atonement throughout this week. And why you came and why you lived, why you died and why you rose again. And how you are preparing us to be with you forever. Help us Lord to walk worthy of this highest calling. To be a saint in Christ. And to be a servant of the most high God. That our lives would be occupied in the master's business. Till you come. Thanking and praising you. For we ask all this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of the Father. Communion of Holy Spirit. Rest and abide with us. Both now and forevermore. Amen.